There are a lot of things that draw me to stories, but in particular I have such a strong adherence to fiction that, in addition to having wonderful writing, is full of great wisdom and anecdotes to incorporate into my own life. I'm aware that that sounds like a pretty generic statement, but that's actually not an easy thing to do because the lessons often need to be naturally integrated while being contributory and compelling enough to really hit home. And that definitely applies to Q. Not only is it deeply emotional, engaging, beautifully written, and full of amazing characters, but it's also chock full of little bits of wisdom that apply to the journeys of the characters and double as life advice. It is without doubt the story that has given me the most amount of valuable wisdom to take in, and I think compiling the most important lessons it's taught me through moments, lines of dialogue, or story dynamics is only appropriate as a sort of tribute to what I've taken away from it. Please note that these are not what I consider to be the best ideas in the series, they're just the most impactful ones for me. And they aren't necessarily an indication of my favorite characters either. For instance, Oikawa, Bokuto, Washijo, and Tanaka are some of my absolute favorite characters in the story, but while I find their arcs to be extremely well executed, they weren't full of advice that applies to me personally, so no moments centered around them are included. I don't think anyone will have a list quite like mine, and that's the beauty of the subjectivity of this sort of topic. And in case you didn't see the warning, once again, this video will contain spoilers for the entire story, including all of the manga. So if you only watch the anime and don't want to be spoiled, I wouldn't watch this video right now. This is probably the most standard message in my list, but the way it's phrased here and all of the context behind it just strikes me as special. I've heard all sorts of ways of framing this mentality in all sorts of stories. It isn't about how you fall down, it's about how you get back up again, etc. But this is the most powerful implementation of it. The interspersed scene of all of the defeated in Nationals, coupled with Hinata's desperate situation and Karasuno's heartbreaking loss, and narrated by Fuki Hibarida, who always seems to be willing to give us these bits of artistic wisdom, inspiration, and insight. Today, you are the defeated. But what will you become tomorrow? It's such an emotional and great way to phrase that, and the spread of Hinata has stuck with me since I first saw it, with this line's function as a kickstart to the ultimate comeback and reunion for all of these characters helping it to inspire me through any point in my life after reading it where I felt like one of the defeated. And one of the best things about this is that like the rest of Haikyuu, it is not only about sport. It applies to life in general, to anyone. Everyone will suffer all sorts of losses and drawbacks in life. This is inevitable and it's impossible to avoid that. And these defeats can be devastating and cruel, but they are never the end of the road and with the proper mentality, they are never not beneficial. As difficult as it may be, soak everything in from the pain of today to fuel a better tomorrow. Take the right things from the experience and learn. Otherwise, the defeat really is pointless. Nishinoya's grandpa is one of the many important elderly folks that the story has a pattern of referencing for just a scene or two, but whose impact far outweighs their minuscule amount of time on screen. And his contribution to the story is primarily to provide us with the context and crux of why Nishinoya is the rampant, hard on his sleeve free spirit that we know and love, while also dropping another bit of key advice for us to ponder. The idea of going outside of your comfort zone has always been something that I could relate to and agree with as a productive and fun way to live life, but it's also always been a concept that felt a bit foreign to me. While agreeing with it, I could never really be convinced of actually doing it all that often because it had kind of been diluted into a generic bit of life advice that I never really felt tempted to adhere to. However, Furudate pulled it off here through their word choice, as well as the variables attached to it. The key is not the general sentiment of it being a good idea to try new things even if you're scared. 
It's the idea of it being a shame and a waste to pass up the opportunity to learn something new, and how that applies to the way such a lovable and in some ways enviable character goes about their life. How many times did I waste an opportunity to discover something I didn't know before or to do something I'd never done before simply because I wanted to gravitate towards the safe and familiar? The phrasing is so important because we always want to maximize the amount of enjoyment we can get from the finite amount of time we're living on this rock. And while I don't think the story is trying to say that everyone should be as wild and adventurous as Noya, occasionally seeing some new and beautiful sights could really end up reaping tons of rewards in that regard. And if something is too scary or overwhelming, get someone else to help you, like Kinoshita helped Noya to do during the game. The context and layers to this theme make it much more comforting and encouraging than the often shallow and oft uttered idea of simply going out of your comfort zone. We shouldn't feel forced to extremes to try new things if we aren't ready and willing, so maybe don't force a kid to pet an angry dog like Grandpa Noya did. But we should be aware of how much of a shame it is to not give things a chance. Suki and Kenma are kind of similar to one another in that they're both reserved and relatively low energy, but the most interesting similarity to me is that neither was really fully committed to or enamored with volleyball at the start. Neither is passionate about it, both state that they don't really find it fun and that they're kinda just doing it for half-hearted reasons in the early stages of the story. With these two, there was always an air of… I'm not ever going to be world class at this, and I don't even like it all that much, so why bother? Why put this time into it? Why work myself to the bone for something like this? And that's an understandable thing to feel. It's sometimes hard to justify putting heart and effort into something if you feel like the end results won't be worth the time put in. But the key for these two was that despite having this non-committal outward attitude towards it, both stuck with it. Neither would get full marks for going 110% at practice in the beginning, but both kept finding a reason to keep coming back. And as a result, both end up finding the beauty in the journey to the end, not the end itself, and in letting that journey guide them instinctually. By the end of the story, neither has volleyball at the absolute forefront of their lives. Kenma pursued the extremely glamorous career of being a YouTuber and streamer, and Suki, while competing at a pro level in Division 2, isn't a world class superstar like a lot of the cast and has an equally important career path running parallel, even though he surely harbors some ambitions of one day reaching those heights. But despite this, neither of those two regretted their decision and both learned to have fun with it due to simply letting go and enjoying the sport. The simple happiness of it, the moments and exhilaration that make it all worth it. It didn't matter that it may not have necessarily led to some grand end point. Though of course, I have to again mention that Suki's arc still has that ambition attached to it. But the point here is that volleyball is fun, and that's why they played and deeply enjoyed. That's all it really comes down to in the end. Experiencing that moment that hooks you, and learning to love it from then on. And so in applying that to my life, I learned to use that idea to help guide my decisions in a way. Life is a series of experiences, and while a certain path may not promise riches at the end of it, if it consists of something you enjoy doing, sometimes that's enough to make it worth it. We need to make our limited time in this world worthwhile, and simple fun with hobbies and pastimes and sports is a more than acceptable way to do that. People sometimes get too caught up in logic and dividends and turn life into too much of an exact science. But Suki and Kenma's journeys help us to see that time spent having fun, within reasonable boundaries of course, is never wasted or futile. In the middle of Hoshiyumi's life-altering match against Karasuno, he verbalizes one of the core tenets of Haikyuu. We aren't limited to only one way of being great. 
In seeing someone in Hinata, another person unlucky to have been born with a lack of height that made the path to his goal much more difficult, and in seeing the different approach Hinata takes to compensate for that and hone his other strengths, Hoshiyumi is inspired. No matter the circumstances, there are no limits to greatness. Life will come at us hard sometimes, but there is always a way forward. And in this very same game, we have a line said by Udai Tenma, the first little giant, that is a bit less flashy and iconic, but no less important. Know your weaknesses. Accept them. Forget the weapons you can't wield. Find all the ones you can, and carefully, persistently, hone them all to a wicked point. It really is a lovely blend of realism and idealism, and an incredibly wise idea that I think many need to hear, and it certainly did me a world of good. No one is good at everything, but everyone is good at something. People are not born equal, and life makes it so that there are some things that some people can't do. That's just reality. But what I love about this whole idea is how it doesn't bemoan harsh reality, it doesn't lament it. It instead frames it as a fuel to improve ourselves in other ways. This is just how the world is, and yes, sometimes it is painful and unfortunate. And it isn't a sin for it to make us feel down sometimes, but at the same time, it is in finding a way through that that we will truly make something of ourselves. No one has an easy path, and everyone has their own obstacles. We all have our own strengths and niches, and we all have some things that are extremely difficult or even impossible for us. But harness the things you can control and do your best to shine at what you can shine at, and you will reap the byproducts. During the Inarizaki match, we're introduced to the school's banner, stating proudly that they don't need memories. And this is a phrase that most of the team, and particularly Atsumu, seem to take to heart and embody. With his raw, passionate, and heartfelt style of play and his borderline obsession with taking risks and trying new things, Atsumu is the personification of the idea that the banner seems to imply, that memories are not needed, and that all that matters is the here and now because we must never rest on the achievements of the past. Yesterday is gone and doesn't matter, but what will we do today to lead us into tomorrow? However, through their loss and through adopting a bit of Kita's mentality, Atsumu is humbled and soon learns the tunnel vision and naivete of the sort of mindset he held, and post timeskip he is characterized by a much more nuanced take on the slogan. He learns that the proper way to interpret the saying is not to cast away your past memories, but to integrate with them. His practices, his losses and pain, his victories, his experiences. They have taught him such valuable things and so it would be stupid to throw all of that away, and he realizes this. And so what he decides to do is make those memories his muscle. He makes his new philosophy one that tells him to charge forward and not lean on past glories, but also to not forget those memories or the impact they had. You don't need to constantly reflect on them if you're inseparable from them, so ingrain them in you and make them a part of you to learn, grow, and reach greater heights in the future. It's a beautiful new complexion on the line that is incredibly inspirational and empowering, yet approached with a lovely sense of balance. And with the context of Atsumu's journey, for me it is the healthiest and most powerful way I've ever seen that idea of living in the now conceptualized. There is always a time to be a bit headstrong as we make our way towards our ambitions, and that is of course a very important element of life. But as with all things, we need to act responsibly. There is a world of difference between not needing our memories and forgetting our memories and what they taught us and mean to us. And we should never, ever forget.
One of the most important lines in the entire series is unsurprisingly uttered by one of the most wholesome and wise characters in the story. In the process of scolding Hinata for selfishly sneaking into Washijo's training camp, Takeda does not reprimand him, partly due to the message having sunk in already, and instead he offers some words of advice. And so he says this, which is an extremely simple and logical way to tell Hinata what his potential path forward may look like. It's something that has been an ever-present element of Haikyuu, that those who want to touch greatness and evolve to progress further must first take steps back to reorientate themselves on the right path to then take the proper steps forward. Evolution is messy, so there's always a struggle and some pain and mistakes at first, but that is how we grow. Sensing Hinata's struggle, Takeda reminds him of this very important fact of life. We all aspire to do things and achieve dreams, whether they be minor or major, and at times we may feel like we're in a rush to get there. Impatience is understandable, and it's something that I definitely suffer from at times, but it's also a huge pitfall that we can fall into from which we may never be able to come back out. But he who climbs the ladder must start at the bottom is such an important reminder that there are no shortcuts on the path to our dreams if we want to do things properly. We must always, always exhale, break ourselves down, and maybe start from square one, to then build ourselves back up. We must always stay humble and open-minded and willing to learn if we want to climb that ladder. And that is what Hinata did during the Ball Boy arc, and the rewards he reaped by heeding Takeda's advice quite literally changed his life and put him on the trajectory towards becoming a truly great player. To piggyback onto the advice from Grant Banoya, this is a quote that I feel is very much related to our libero, but that sprawls outwards from there towards the late stages of Nationals and post time skip to become an all-encompassing and primary mantra of Haikyuu. The core of it is something centered around the visual of Noya, hands on his hips, taking in the grand expanse of opportunity and freedom ahead of him symbolized by the deep blue ocean. And from there my thoughts take me to Mia Osumu, who had no doubts that following the seemingly unconventional path into the food industry was the right one for him despite his insane prowess on the court. And eventually, in my mind, the message then spreads to the rest of the cast. A group of people who followed their hearts to get to where they wanted to be, sometimes in spite of what others may have expected of them. We need not adhere to the roles that people assume of us, and if we're not passionate about something we're really good at, we have no obligation to follow it if it doesn't make our hearts sing. And on the flip side, this idea can be reversed and applied to the monsters that make it onto the grand stage. Ushijima, Bokuto, Hoshiyumi, Kagiyama, Hinata, especially Oikawa, and more. Even if we feel like we aren't naturally good at something, even if we feel like we have to work much harder than others to get as good as them, if we love something, if we truly love it, there is no reason to not pursue it despite what that doubting voice in our head and what those around us may say. Being good and being strong is being free. Cast off that which does not matter. Follow your own path and your own sense of freedom, because as we'll discuss in a bit, no one knows you better than you. So it's important to trust in that. After all, why limit your own freedom and fulfillment for insignificant reasons? This one isn't as much of something that Haikyuu taught me or recontextualized for me as much as it is a very effective reminder. There are times in our lives where things get hectic, and anxious, and stressful. Fueled by the adrenaline of fight or flight, we try to barrel through, cope, and just make do with living with this feeling of being bound until it hopefully passes. But in doing so, we sometimes forget to properly breathe and take that step back that we often need to soothe our minds a bit and better approach these situations. And of course, this applies to sport as well, and is best seen through Karasuno's high-octane yet self-restrictive approach during the final point. 
darkness slowly creeps up on everyone. They start to feel trapped and unable to breathe. Panic begins to set in. And then suddenly... It all dissipates and fades away. Everyone is free and able to breathe. Everyone can see the light. All thanks to Hinata. Who the hell would have thought that this kid would become this personification of calmness and zen? But at this point in the story, it's undeniable that the things he learned as Ball Boy have helped him not just technically, but psychologically too. Taking a breath is so important in life. For perspective, for self-care, for approaching things more efficiently and with a better mindset. And Furudate knows the importance of this, and incorporates it into such an elegant way in the context of a match. And I like to use this theme as a bit of a lead-in into another very calming and deeply profound bit of storytelling that we get during the Kamomedai match. In a flashback that shows an early exchange between Hoshiyumi and Hirogami, we see that Hirogami is struggling a ton with the burden of expectation on his shoulders, mostly from his family, to succeed in volleyball. So much so that he has grown to view the sport as a chaining obligation of pain rather than an outlet for joy as so many others see it. Every mistake is despairing, and every failure is not looked at as a chance to learn and improve, but instead as a reminder that he is no good. This even leads to self-harm, cursing the hands that are unable to live up to the lofty expectations. But when he explains this to Hoshiyumi, the latter simply asks him why he doesn't quit. You're not enjoying it, so why are you doing it? And it's a response that is almost hilarious in its childlike innocence and simplicity, yet genius in a way because of that. And in hearing this, Hirogami's clouds part and he can see things much more clearly in a very similar way to how Hinata calms everyone down in the midst of their match. With this reply, Hoshiyumi reminds him that life isn't a narrow path with only one option. He has the freedom to choose and live the way he wants. Despite feeling that pressure, he doesn't have to pursue volleyball as a career if he doesn't want to. He had always thought of it as the sole possible option and had grown to resent how trapped and inadequate it made him feel. But seeing things more clearly, he realizes that he was wrong and that he can quit whenever it gets too much or whenever he doesn't want to do it anymore. And that option helps him to enjoy it again, not feeling any burden at all. Through this realization, he calms down and adopts a much healthier mindset, which helps him to become the colossal player he is during Nationals. There are many parallels between Hinata and Hoshiyumi, and I think that this is one too. Their simple yet profound views on the world, and how what they have suffered through and learned help them to soothe those around them. We can easily get caught up in our own minds and the doom and gloom of the moment, but oftentimes it isn't as complicated as we think. Sometimes the most productive thing to do is to take a breath, look at things in a more balanced way, and reset. And things tend to seem a lot brighter, easier, and simpler when you do that, in both micro situations and life in general. Kazuyo Kageyama was the type of grandfather that anyone would be extremely lucky to have. Clearly loving, caring, enthusiastic, and invested in making his family happy. And the tiny bit we see of him does more than enough to help us understand why his death left such an agonizing hole in Kageyama's life. But what strikes me most about him has a lot to do with this line. Something I love about the story is that it's very aware that life is multifaceted and complex, and that people have different perspectives. One person's opinion or solution may not work out for another, and the characters are often very aware of that. And Kazuyo's philosophy here illustrates it well. As chapter 387 moves through Kageyama's early childhood, it reaches a point where his sister Miwa, who used to be quite enthusiastic about volleyball, decides that she wants to stop playing with her grandpa and brother. And while the implication is that it was due to a growing lack of interest, the upfront reason for it is that the girls' volleyball team requires the members to have short hair, and that she didn't want to cut hers. 
The natural assumption would be to expect someone to call that reason silly, or for Kazuyo to ask her if she's thought this through properly. But instead, he assumes that Miwa has already thought it through and simply accepts it. Which leads to this line. Here, his granddaughter had stopped partaking in his passion, so it would be natural for anyone to be disappointed. But in actuality, he doesn't express any negative feelings, nor does he second-guess her. Instead, he's happy that she's found a path and made a life decision that she thought would suit her, and he states his confidence in her judgement. And as it turns out, his trust wasn't misplaced at all, because her fixation on her hair was a hint that her future consisted of a happy career in the hair and makeup industry. Kazuyo is a wonderful human being, and a big part of that is based in his ability to respect his family and not assume that he knows what's good for them better than they do. There is always room for advice and wisdom, but here he saw the situation and simply smiled, trusted her, and expressed happiness at a significant life choice. Of course there are no hard feelings if she doesn't want to pursue volleyball. Everyone has different passions, and if Miwa wants to focus on other things, then awesome. Because what we can get from this pearl of wisdom is the following. Trust in ourselves. Obviously, don't get cocky, tunnel-visioned, and narrow-minded, and be sure to rely on others if needed. But at the end of the day, you are your own best friend, and if your heart tells you to make a decision, there is a good chance that that in itself makes it a good decision. Don't go mindlessly being reckless, but have confidence. We may feel like our own worst enemy sometimes as we doubt ourselves, put ourselves down, and express disbelief in our own abilities. Which is a key thematic thread for Asahi during the Kemometai match, funnily enough. But at the end of the day, we ourselves should be the first person we can lean on when things get tough. And as difficult as it can be, Learning to trust in ourselves is one of the most important things we can do in life. This is something that Asahi was finally able to do after struggling with it for years, and it is something that Kazuyo knew through his extensive life experience. And I have no doubt that his lessons passed on after he was gone. Because while his grandchildren may have been headstrong, the one thing they were never lacking was a belief in themselves and a confidence that the path they were on was the right one, no matter how difficult that path was. These words from Tendo to Ushijima after his friend painfully dwells on his own tunnel vision and immaturity during their defeat against Kurasuno have been ones that struck me since the minute I first heard them. On one level, they're easily applicable to the entire story. Whether it be in or outside of the court, so many of these characters are driven by a childlike fervor and spark in their eye that dictates their path in life. From Osamu letting his passion for food guide his direction, to Noya simply following wherever his intuitive heart takes him, to our monsters letting their love fuel their actions, and even to Washijo, who grows old but learns to rekindle that idealistic, childish love thanks in large part to Hinata, this story is essentially about a collection of childlike, lovable idiots. And they may grow up and mature in ways, but they never lose that kid inside of them. And the more they stumble forward and the more Haikyuu progresses, the more importance this line seems to have. But aside from the narrative significance, this quote is very relevant to me personally, particularly because I've always been someone with that mentality too. I've grown up and had to take on all sorts of responsibilities and annoying adult stuff, but I only do those things to toss aside the tedium and get to what really matters. The simple childlike joys I've learned to love. I've always been someone who really values nostalgia and sentiment in media, and so many games and stories I've consumed at a young age are still very relevant to me today. Pokemon, Animal Crossing, The Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy to an extent, and many more. And this influence is pretty clear in a lot of tracks that I use as background music for these videos. Once every few months or so, I take an afternoon to listen to the soundtracks from the games that I loved as a kid and continue to love now to ground myself and remind myself of the beauty of these stories and the conflicting pain of innocent times gone by. 
I try to work hard throughout the day so that at the end of it, I can spend some time playing a game or watching a show, because it's fun. And this channel itself, being able to talk about stories that evoke that childish wonder in me, has fulfilled that need in so many ways. So I think that we should always try to listen to that little kid inside of us, because if we lose sight of that, and if life becomes this monotonous slog of nothing to look forward to, what is the point? Tendo is right. The things that drive people are childish in general. And I don't think that we should ever bury that drive and desire, because it's an exquisitely beautiful thing both in and outside of Haikyuu. Coach Ukai's little tidbit of advice here isn't one of the flashiest quotes, but to me it's far and away one of the most vital for both the story and anyone experiencing the story. And it's a subversion that is far more healthy and productive than the alternative sentiment that people tend to spout ad nauseum. We hear it all the time in all sorts of narratives, in sport, even in day-to-day -day life. Surpass your limits, go beyond what you're capable of, things like that. And while the sentiment of these sorts of ideas and words is often empowering and wholesome, the complexion of it is actually kind of reckless and unhealthy in some ways. Pushing yourself beyond what you're capable of and going past what your body and mind can handle is not something that anyone should actually do. And of course I'm aware of how athletes need to push themselves and break their muscle fibers down in order for them to build back up stronger and more efficient. Within reason, that sort of thing is necessary for proper progress and I don't view that as going past your limits as much as to the edge of those limits. But there are levels to this. Doing something that you literally cannot handle, regardless of whether that is fueled by passion or a dream or whatever, is simply unacceptable. Not only because it's harmful to yourself, but because it simply won't help you to achieve your dream and it's counterproductive. And Hinata learned that in a very harsh way during Nationals. He had made incredible strides in all of the technical volleyball skills, showing exponential improvement in so many ways. But he hit his ceiling because he failed to take his health into account and pushed through on fumes of adrenaline. And that was the final and most important lesson he had to learn, which Ukai voices so beautifully here. Push yourself in a healthy way, without putting yourself at risk. Haikyuu is always very clear to emphasize care and diligence, doing things with intensity and fire and passion, but doing things the proper way at the same time. And while I'm in pretty okay shape, I've never really been an overly health conscious person or someone that often thought to take care of myself. But this line really woke me up and inspired me to do better. We are not creatures capable of reaching some threshold and going super saiyan by continuously pushing. We are human beings with our feet on the ground, and we do have limits. Every single one of us, in this very moment, has a limit to what we can do, and trying to go past it right now is just foolhardy. It is a disappointing truth of reality that we can't just magically sprout wings and take to the sky. But something that Haikyuu has taught us is that through following the proper steps, we can build our own wings. Effort is necessary for progress, but aimless effort alone not channeled into the right places will not get you anywhere. Maturing and learning where to put that effort and how to balance it in a healthy way with other aspects of life, and in doing so learning how to push your limits further, that is the way to move forward. If you surpass your limits, you will hurt yourself. But if you take the proper avenues, you can elevate those limits and grow your capabilities within them in a sensible way. To achieve one's dreams, one can't just sit idly by and give some half-hearted effort, and so of course one needs to push themselves. And what Ukai is saying here is to push yourself, but to do it properly. Our life goals are very often things that can't be achieved without taking a moment to gather ourselves and broaden our perspective, and in the end, we need to look out for ourselves. And this is an idea that I have difficulty fully expressing my appreciation of. 
While it does achieve peak hype and narrative gratification through its matches, Haikyuu consistently shows a sense of balance by always emphasizing this way of approaching life. And as simple as that concept seems, there really aren't too many stories that take the time to properly do that. But it definitely doesn't go unnoticed, and I'm so appreciative of this story for how it consistently reminds me to center myself. Hopefully I've gotten this idea across well enough, but to sum up, despite the amazing storytelling achieved through the blood-pumping matches, the thing that makes Haikyuu really special for me is how in tune it is with the human soul through the intertwining and beautifully written character arcs, the amazing thematic execution, and surprise surprise, the little lessons we can take in along the way. From Chapter 1, it is an exceedingly wholesome and therapeutic story centered in a sage-like, profound wisdom that teaches the audience so many things through offering that insight to the characters and incorporating it. There's a calming, peaceful sense of serenity to this story, and it is through this approach that it achieves it. And so this takes me to the final and most important lesson that Haikyuu has taught me. I am built upon the small things I do every day, and the end results are no more than a byproduct of that. As I've explained in my Inarizaki video, these words from Kita form the philosophical core of his monster speech, which in turn pivots the entire series into a whole new realm stylistically, thematically, and in terms of storytelling quality. Kita is something of a fan-favorite character and is often celebrated for being so contributory despite having such a small amount of screen time throughout the entire run. And I think that's because in addition to him just being a genuinely beautiful soul and a really awesome player and captain, he is the character that best embodies that serene side of Haikyuu that I mentioned. While characters like Hinata, Kagiyama, or maybe Oikawa best exemplify the concept of the hungry monster that drives this story forward the best, Kita is hands down the character that symbolizes the tranquil, gentle spirit and foundations from which all of these grand ideas can spring from. And he does it immediately through what is basically the first material of substance that we get about him. The story of what his grandmother taught him and how that slowly evolved into a natural, diligent way of life that simply made him feel good, and how he began to apply those ideals to everything he did to try and achieve his goals. His heartwarming reaction to earning his jersey, and finally, the now iconic words he shared with Adan. I would consider myself to be pretty laid back and composed now, but throughout my teenage years I was often someone who couldn't handle stressful or high intensity situations that well. I played football, or soccer, for many years and was also in a pretty competitive situation for school, so I would often grasp for straws to try and ground myself and never really succeeded as well as I wished I could have, and I was often anxious as a result. Having someone like Kita around as a soothing influence and mentor would have done wonders for me. But I digress. My point is, I calmed down a bit from that and matured, but it wasn't until I first read the Inarizaki match a few years ago that I properly became a calm person at my core. And that was due to Kita's story. Life can drag us up and down and sideways, it can play tricks with us and yank our emotions all over the place, and it can be a lot to handle. And that's why grounding ourselves is so important. To see things clearly without the noise, and to respond accordingly and act in the best way we possibly can. To go about our lives in honest ways not just to reap the rewards, but because it's a gratifying, balanced way to live full of longevity and peace. We are built upon the small things we do every day, and the end results are no more than the byproduct. Like Washijo says, simple is best. If we prepare for things, if we go about things the right way, why should we worry about how we perform those things when the occasion calls for it? Why should we not live in a way that can provide us with good health, peace of mind, and the platform to succeed? It's such a simple concept, but Kita verbalizing it and it being presented in this way all kind of put it together for me and genuinely helped me put myself together, and I think it's the sort of message that anyone can take something from. 
Whether that's something be related to confidence, routine, overall health, or just learning to live in a happier or more fulfilling way. Furudate often downplays their own qualities in interviews, but the entire body of work that is Haikyuu is exemplary proof of how wise they are. It's the type of rare story that I re-experience not just for the emotions and engagement it brings me, but because it seems like every time I watch or read it, I learn a bunch of new things that I hadn't really made note of before. This is my current list of the most affecting things the story has taught me, and I'm sure that it won't be the final one given how rich it is, but either way these are all extremely important and I think they're worth pointing out. There is absolutely no chance that I've covered all of the ones that were important to you, so please feel free to provide some other Haikyuu lessons that mean something to you if I didn't mention them. I'll see you guys later, but for now, and as always, many thanks for watching.